sniper here. Hey there, welcome to another episode of Intuition, whereby we take a look at behind the scenes of academia. My name is Lila, and today I will be your host. Today we're asking, university students, are we all just robots? As a recent graduate, I've finally been able to look back at my time here at UBC and reflect on what does my four years of undergrad education means to me. And one of the things that always popped into my mind and in conversation with my peers is no doubt the multiple challenges that we have to go through in order to cross that finish line and get our degrees. University students are often faced with endless streams of assignments, exams, midterms, and quizzes. We have to worry about picking classes that look good on our transcript, deciding on our majors, um, making sure that our GPA is where we want it to be at, and then think about graduation requirements. But does this mentality of having to go through a checklist and then getting that degree, or as I've heard some of my peers call it, that stamp shiny piece of paper, undermines our ability to develop as learners and to think critically? One of the things that led us to explore the question for today is the contemporary discourse in higher education that university students are often lacking in quote-unquote critical thinking skills. And you can see that there's been some studies being published on this. One of the more popular ones is the book Academically Adrift, Limited Learning College Campuses by Richard Aram and Josepa Roxa, who in 2011 published some very interesting statistics on students' ability to think critically along with other core skills that they're expected to gain throughout university. And so, to go back to our main question, if students are really just robots who can't think critically, what are the consequences of our inability to do so, and how do we circumvent this problem? Can we do it while jumping through all these hurdles we call university? To answer that question, Flynn and I were privileged to have a discussion with Dr. Neil Amritich from the Department of Sociology and Dr. Jenny Peterson from the Department of Political Science. Both of them gave us some interesting insights on how students can grow by engaging with their academics. And we'll unpack further by what we mean by this engagement later on in the episode. Before we can answer that big question, if university students are just robots who have to game through a series of checklists and not be constantly exposed to think critically, we asked Neil and Jenny, what is their definition of critical thinking? Or in other words, what does it mean to them? So when I say critical thinking to my students, I feel like they focus on the word critical and they think it means critique. Mm -hmm. So often um, when if I have a student hand back an essay or something where, where we've asked for more evidence of critical thinking, they'll be like, oh, but I did, I criticized a policy or I criticized a war or I criticized an intervention. I feel like that's one of the biggest hurdles we have to overcome as um, professors or educators is, is getting students to really understand that critical thinking isn't about criticizing. Um, so what is critical thinking then? Um, for me, uh, critical thinking is about questioning information and not questioning information in a skeptical way, but thinking about how did we get this information? Where is it coming from? Uh, who's giving me this information? Are there other ways of looking at this information that will get me to not a different answer, but a, an alternative way of looking at things? Trying to get students to understand tensions between different points of view and not just for the sake of you know saying, oh, there's two sides of the debate, but why is there two sides of the debate? How can we evaluate those sides of the debate? So that, that's what critical thinking is to me, is being really interrogating information, questioning information, but not in a critical way or not necessarily in a way of trying to prove that one way is right and one way is wrong, but really understanding where that information is coming to, how we got this knowledge. For me, critical thinking is very much in the scientific method. And it's kind of like, how do we reason and how do we elucidate information and think of new ways of looking at that information? So it's very much similar to what um, Jen says. But I'm more concentrated on the method. How do we actually teach in the scientific method? Because I think if you teach the scientific method and offer the different types of methods and different ways of approaching information, producing information, analyzing information, then you lead students into, hopefully, critical thinking. I wouldn't say I teach critical thinking, I'll say I'll teach the scientific method, because the scientific method enables critical thinking. Uh, sometimes I think we've gone straight to the point too quickly and call something critical thinking. I did my undergraduate in a different country, so we didn't use English terminology, but I've tried to think what was used instead, and nothing was used instead. Learning was enabled and facilitated in a certain way. I think that led us to critical thinking. So Neil and Jenny gave some very raw and abstract ideas of their own definition of critical thinking. But if we are to play it out day to day in the class and on campus, what does it look like to them? If we're going to role model it, it means that I'm looking for 
challenge. It's very funny actually to read and cross evaluations and students will sometimes read, if you disagree with a the prof then you are in trouble. And it's like, no, you're not. We're looking forward to it. But sometimes I think students think that they have to agree or kind of support the ideas. I know my style is more provocative. I try to provoke and kind of could think of it this way, so to role model it. I think I need to do better personally and kind of um, saying that. But again, I think the problem is getting into that trap of thinking about critical thinking being about agreeing or disagreeing with a point. And if you disagree with a point, then you need to strongly argue against that point because there's so many other ways to engage in critical thinking. One first step is, yes, do I disagree with the professor or do I agree with the professor? But I worry that that then creates a sense of a very black and white world. And I think uh, we have to do a lot more to teach critical thinking Uh, skills that aren't about proving X or Y, um, that are about grappling with that messy middle, Mm -hmm. those very problematic gray areas. Um, And so while I do think it is important for to get across to students that yes, it's okay to disagree with your professor, and that is one way of thinking critically, of thinking about argumentation and which argument has like more evidence or whatnot. But I, I I think that's kind of almost like the the first step of critical thinking or the easy kind of critical thinking. Um, and it's much more important, I think, to focus on the the why do people disagree? Why are there different viewpoints? Mm. Um, what kind of evidence got us to these different viewpoints? Um, how do we evaluate that evidence? I guess linking to Neil's point about the, the scientific method. So moving away from the critical thinking as trying to determine right versus wrong and and grappling with those much more difficult kind of epistemic or methodological questions. Yeah, I, th- I think it may come from a schooling system or if you've gone through a school and you think there's one correct answer and therefore if someone gives you another answer then you have to argue against it and it's this kind of tennis match type of debate and the whole idea of critical thinking scientific is to kind of show the nuances and show the limitations of knowledge as well. So I do feel though that students sometimes Initially, you can see in obviously the first few years, necessarily the first year, that they will kind of have this, I've decided what my point is going to be, I've decided where this is going to end, and whatever I do, I'm going to get there, and I'll argue it even if I don't have the evidence or the rationale or the kind of, to support it, but I've got a feeling that I need to take a standpoint, and it's this kind of rush to decide and maybe a better way to think of it is uh, see it as a bit of an adventure you don't know where you'll end up and therefore you have to actually go and actually read things and look at things and take things and be ready to be open to change your ideas and your opinions and play with them so i think a lot of critical thinking is less about having a fixed end and allowing yourself to kind of play and be allowing to play and then be contingent and see where it goes and teach students that you may end up in a point that you never considered and if you want to get a good, if you want to make the essay make sense, then you might have to go back and rewrite the introduction. So those were some interesting points being raised by both Neil and Jenny, who concluded that to be able to sort of like get into the habit of critical thinking, you have to be extremely open-minded and be willing to take risks. But is the demand for students to do these two things realistic? And I think that some of the concerns that students may have is that all these challenges and opportunities aren't really fun and it's not really interesting. It may be a bit difficult for students to feel inspired to take on this risk as, you know, their grades are at stake. So is there a safe and realistic way for students to go about these intellectual challenges while still feeling safe and supported in getting the grade or the outcome that they want? I think that that um, there's this tension of you know wanting our students to be creative, engage in critical thinking, challenge ideas, question ideas, th- think about things in new ways. Um, but if students do that, and then they don't see that as improving their grades. Um, if there's not a direct link between kind of taking that leap that we're asking them to take when we ask them to engage in critical thinking. And so I do think that at the same time we encourage and insist on critical thinking, we need to create um, lower stake opportunities for students to practice that. I don't think, you know, a, a term paper that's worth 40% is a great time to really put yourself out there and experiment with a new way of thinking. And it, you know, it is much safer to be like, well, you know, the professor kind of argue that these two theories are important in understanding this phenomenon, so I'm just going to play it safe, 
focus on these two theories, which I know really well, which I know will, will eventually get me to a, a good answer um, and you know get an A minus versus take a risk and incorporate two completely different theories with a case study that the professor didn't even bring into class. And you know it's, I think it's a great idea, but I've not really had time to practice it out or, or to tease it out. And that's a huge risk to take when you've got 40% of your grade at stake. So I, I do think professors have a lot more of a role to play in this. That being said, students also need to take initiative. And if they do want to experiment and they do want to play with ideas, especially in a high stakes assignment, I mean, that's what office hours are for. So my students who take these, what I often consider to be huge risks intellectually that I, that I love, the ones who get A's out of doing that are the ones who come to my office hours, not because they came to my office hours, okay, you get an A, but it allows me to shape and facilitate that critical investigation because it is a different way of thinking. Students are often, when they do this, they're dealing with different ideas, different theories, different concepts, different ways of presenting information, and they do need guidance in that. So I would encourage any students who are wanting to, you know, you know, take the plunge, not play it safe, and engage in this kind of critical thinking that we're asking for, to really take advantage of office hours, either with professors or with TAs, to make sure that all that creative energy, all those risks that they're taking with their thinking, that it does pay off. And and having the support of your professor or your TA guide you on that, that journey, because at the end of the day, you still need to, you know, you need to fulfill the assignment criteria. You need to fulfill the conventions of of academic and scholarly writing um, and so to do all those things whilst also taking these big intellectual risks it's it's not an easy thing to do so I, I think as much as we have a role as professors um, to to model that facilitate it create lower stake opportunities for it they need to make much better use of office hours so those are really good pointers which Jenny mentioned for students who are looking for practical steps to feel much more challenged in their academics. What are the restrictions for students who want to engage in this intellectual leap or challenge? Critical thinking takes time. Mm-hmm. And it takes time to actually think through ideas. And you can't actually just come up with a flash in the pan idea and, well, you can, but it takes time to actually flush it out and actually get it articulated correctly because sometimes the best ideas take some time to actually kind of develop and actually get until you're confident because sometimes you have to test them a few times and realize well actually it wasn't a great, wasn't a great idea at all mm-hmm. if you don't have the time to do it then it's, it's not it's going to be easier for you to kind of take the the well-trodden path and the easiest path and it'll take the two theories that you think are safe with and you're not less likely to play um, unless I think the correct like Jen said if you actually kind of have some formative or some other sort of assessment, lower stakes assessment that would lead up to it, to practice that, and then maybe be slightly different. Because then at least you're inculcating some behaviours that when it gets to the end or the bigger paper, then they've actually done some practice. But it takes time, and obviously if you've got the time, great. If you don't have the time, jobs, things, etc., life, then uh, critical thinking is difficult. So we've established some ideas about what critical thinking is and how they can be applied to learning on campus. But going back to the big question of are students just robots, both Neil and Jenny brought up the idea of grades as something that demotivates students from being creative and experimenting with different ideas or methods in their academics. And as many of us know from experience, some students can go really extreme with this idea, judging from the whole talk about GPA booster courses or whispers about who are the professors that give out easy A's. So so for the next major chunk of our conversation with Neil and Jenny, we teased out further about the idea of grades being the sole end game for a university. We asked them, should the pressure to get a certain grade prevent students from learning new things and challenging themselves? Can you have a healthy balance between attaining the two? Grades, for better or for worse, I won't get into how I feel about the grading system all the time, but grades are important to students, they're important to institutions. I think you can get good grades whilst also taking like rigorous courses that yeah make you into good critical thinkers and I think again I mean there's work to do definitely on on the professor side the you know and that's one of the thing the you know the educational leadership track is definitely pushing professors to to be better um, but I think students yeah when they're choosing their courses don't choose it based on 
what the GPA is. I, I very rarely have um, students who are thinking about taking my course email me ahead of time and say like, hey, what's your course about? What are the assignments like? Um, you know, and I tell them what my assignments are like and I tell them the, my philosophy behind the class. But I would say, you know, maybe, maybe two or three times a year, I'll get a student emailing me before they decide to take my class um, to talk to me about the class. And like, obviously, I, you know, I don't have time to talk to hundreds of students every year, but I think if you're the kind of student who's like, you know what, I don't want to be a robot. I want to learn how to be a critical thinker. I want to learn how to solve global, local problems in innovative, creative ways. Don't choose your courses based on um, the GPA. Don't choose your courses based on whispers about which professors um, do X, Y, or Z. Actually talk to the professors because a professor that responds to your inquiry or a professor who sees an email from a student saying like, hey, I'm looking for a course that really challenges me in this way. Um, a professor who gets back to that student and actually responds to that student in a meaningful way is probably, you know, even if the course is challenging, it's probably a course you want to take. So I think students have nothing to lose if they're kind of on the fence about a course um, or they're, you know, they're looking for a particular skill set and they're not sure if X, Y, and Z courses are going to deliver that email the professors, yeah. drop by the professor's offices, but um, a professor who's probably going to challenge you and get you to think and help you develop the skills you want to develop are probably the professors who are going to respond to your emails. That'll be your first clue that it's probably going to be a good course. I always tell students um, who come to me asking me what, what courses to take, and I tell them to take methods courses, mm -hmm. and they don't understand why I'm telling them to take methods, but that's not, I mean, that's really boring. Mm -hmm. I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> But when you understand methods and how methods are applied and how knowledge is constructed, then you'll see everything that you've read since that completely differently mm -hmm. and you'll understand it a lot more. Um, so I think we need to put a greater emphasis on the method. Mm -hmm. um, many times a lot of our courses are very substantive, lots of content, lots of interest, and we pick up something from that and we move on to the next course and we kind of use that. But the methods and doing the methods, if you can do, you know what I mean, that's why undergraduate research would be such an important thing, actually doing, because then you actually start to understand the problems, limitations, and um, yeah. So those are the suggestions that Neil and Jenny brought up for a student who might be thinking how they can feel challenged while not being worried about the grade of their course. But going further than just communicating with professors and being more conscious and thoughtful of their work, we followed up with them on what else can students do in order to be active participants of the academic experience. And there were some really excellent points, which was for me really the biggest takeaway from the discussion about creating a specific type of culture that allows departments across the university to be innovative and just take a listen on what they have to say. Like not all professors read all other professors' course evals, but you know at certain times, so like tenure and promotion and annual reviews and whatnot. I mean, you know, members of senior members of, of, of faculty might read other course evaluations, and if they're seeing students in course evaluation say like this professor was great because he or she encouraged me to do X, Y, and Z, you know. I think it is about like changing the culture, culture a little bit and I do you know I again I think students have a, a real role to play in in changing the culture yeah. of the classroom and changing how we we teach um, I mean you know lots of times my students will be in my office hours and they'll be telling him telling me about cool things they're doing in other courses oh professor Sens does this or you know and um, and that it that makes me think oh should I be doing that in my course? Can I do that in my course? And then maybe I'll go have a conversation with my colleague down the hall, like, hey, your student was telling me. And so I think students can help create um, a different culture. They can help spread these ideas a little bit. Um, so I know there's like the Political Science Students Association. So if you're a student and you're like, okay, I really loved what happened in this class. I'd like to see more of it. But like, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not the kind of student who's gonna go into a professor's office and say, I think you could do more of X. I mean, have a chat with your, um, you know, yeah. whatever discipline you're in or whatever program you're in, have a chat with the, Congrats. I mean, that's one of the things that these student associations are there for is, I mean, they're partly there, they have a lot of functions, um, but one of their functions is to feed back to the department about um, informal uh, feedback from students. So, you know, we have occasionally undergrad students in our, in our faculty meetings, if they're representing the PSSA, for example, um, and that's a time where, um, you know, they can feed back to us like, oh, we're, we've got this feedback from students. They'd like to see more experiential learning or they'd like to see more of that. I mean, that's really helpful for faculty. So even if there, you know, so there is this power disparity, but I do feel there's ways that, 
even the most introverted, shyest of students um, can feed in and try and shape their education. Again, it's not totally on students, but um, it has to be a symbiotic relationship. So I would encourage students not to just kind of whisper, I think you said they whisper behind closed doors kind of thing. Like, don't whisper yeah. behind closed doors. Talk to your professors. Tell them what you're enjoying about their classes. Tell other professors about what you're enjoying about so-and-so's class. And and help um, help us spread that culture so, so that we're not just creating these robots, as you say. That's yeah. terrifying. <laughs> And finally, we concluded our discussion with the true meaning of being a critical thinker as a student and how can we really apply it wholeheartedly instead of just using the term as a blanket catchphrase or a buzzword to feel like as if we are beyond the norm. We also asked, although critical thinking is something that we should all value and strive for, what are the dangers of being obsessed with the whole notion of thinking critically? Can even the most robotic students fake their way to critical thinking? Even though I think critical thinking should be start as soon as they students walk through the door so to speak I think you I think sometimes the critical thinking discourse I'm going to be critical of, I'm going to do some critical thinking about critical thinking here is that the critical thinking discourse leads so students meta. yeah so leads everyone to think that we should be doing it from day one and this you see paragraphs in essays where students have gone this is my critical thinking paragraph uh, or this is my kind of critical kind of paragraph and it's so kind of clearly and I think that's doing them injustice and I think in many ways I would actually say maybe we should back off the critical thinking in the first year and try to think about how and again it's going back to the method really and thinking about how the methods come and the history of the method and taking students through that and because in many ways I, until you understand something and you actually understand how things put together and work it's hard to be critical of it mm -hmm. you need to understand where it's come from first and sometimes if we kind of bang on about critical thinking from day one we fall into this trap of I need to critique this I need to critique this no 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 that's not what it is about back to that kind of so it's kind of maybe take off the pressure a little bit in the first year uh, because then if we actually try to install critical thinking in the first year huge classes then we, could, we might actually create more problems than we actually try to... We're not demanding huge critical thinking in the first year, we're just demanding that you understand and know when it's applicable. Um, and I think that's the first step. Um, I think sometimes we might think that we have to get to critical thinking. How do we scaffold it? How, what do we expect students to be doing at the end of the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year? And then how do we design and kind of think around those. But I, I think, um, I mean, ideally, yes, professors would like scaffold that in and design it. In a perfect world, all professors would be thinking about these things. But again, partly because of the pressures and, and yeah. whatnot, this doesn't happen. So I, again, not to put everything onto students, but I feel like students could also say like, okay, this is a class where I'm really, it looks, it looks like the professor just wants me to memorize definitions and, and be able to repeat those back and get on with it set yourself your own critical thinking goals then, right? So I'm thinking, you know, let's take an example from my Poly 100 class, and we talk about three different types of justice, and we talk about cosmopolitan, communitarianism, and um, intergenerational or green, green notions of justice. Now, you know, really all I expect my students to do is to be able to kind of um, know what, you know, kind of know the definitions about each of those and how they might apply to the case study that we talked about in class. But maybe a student, if they're like, you know, I, I want more, I want more than just having to learn these three definitions of justice, you know, set, set themselves a goal. Be like, well, by the end of the semester, I'd also like to understand it a little bit more about the history between the development of these three concepts of justice. Where did they come from? What theoretical traditions are they linked to? So students can also, if they feel, you know, if they feel like they're robots and they feel like they're just sat in a class learning something, I'm not expecting students to be able to kind of design their own learning outcomes, but maybe as an experiment to just to see how you can do this on your own, because I also want to resist this sense that professors need to teach, teach yeah. students how to do everything and that um, that unless a professor says it's okay to do X, Y, or Z, or think in X, Y, and Z terms, that we shouldn't do it. So I, I would encourage students to set themselves just small challenges in each course they're taking and be like, oh, this is interesting. Maybe by the end of the term, I'll force myself to, to learn X, Y, and Z on top of the course material. And I think that's actually one of the best ways to encourage critical thinking is for students to almost define for themselves what looking at information critically would be. Um, mm. You know, again, we have 
a hundred, I, you know, in my, I'm thinking my 300 level class, I have a hundred different students taking a course on peace building, and I probably have a hundred different reasons for why students are in that course. And I, I can't get to know all of my students. I can't tailor my teaching to each student. I can't make sure, there's no way I can make sure that every student is getting exactly what they want out of that class. Um, and so, to a degree, I, I also think students have to think, well, what do I want to get out of this class and how am I going to achieve that for myself? And that kind of independence, yeah. and independence in what are my learning goals, independence on what I want to get out of this material, that's critical thinking in and, in and of itself. Oh. To not wait for a professor to say, like, here's how you think critically about justice. Here's how you think critically about class. Think for yourself, what would it mean to think critically about justice? What would it mean for me as a person individually to think about class in a critical way? So don't, don't wait for that invitation, just do it yourself. So that was Dr. Jenny Peterson from the Department of Political Science and Dr. Neil Armitage from the Department of Sociology, who has been kind and generous enough to sit with us to talk about critical thinking in the university and the supposed robotization of students today. I think that was a really insightful discussion on how we can foster critical thinking among university students, and here are my major takeaways from the discussion. Firstly, critical thinking is more like a habit. It is not like a concept or an equation that you can learn, and it's certainly not something that is tangible or something that you can sort of point out in an essay as both Jenny and Neil mentioned. And this idea is frequently misunderstood by students who frequently think that being a critical thinker means that you have to be critical in a negative way or be skeptical about something. I like to think of it as more of a soft skill that you have to keep working on all the time and you find yourself doing automatically as time goes by. But more importantly, it is crucial to recognize that it is a higher level of thinking that sometimes can only be done after you have gained a solid understanding of your material. So perhaps if we are trying to understand why students are not be able to think critically, we may have to reassess their ability to understand the material before we jab at students and paint them with a broad brush for not being able to think critically. Secondly, there has to be a symbiotic relationship between both professors and students. Neil mentioned a really good point early on on the fact that good, hard, critical thinking takes a lot of time and thus the ability to be creative and to experiment with new ideas and methods can be a risky move for students who may not be well supported. Therefore, it is important that students receive the necessary guidance and facilitation when they are trying out something new. However, they should also show some initiative in thinking outside the box with regards to academics, and I really like how Jenny mentioned that students should not wait for an invitation, but to just do it themselves. Finally, it is possible for students to not put their grades at risk and still be creative in their academic journey. Jenny and Neil provided some good tips, such as attending office hours and connecting with professors well before enrolling in a class for students who may want to feel secure while going outside of their comfort zone. However, we acknowledge that not all students, due to their unique situation and experience, will be able to take those steps, but they should constantly be seeking out opportunities, no matter how small, to push themselves. So to answer the question for this episode, are university students just robots? I think that your time and experience at university really depends on what you make out of it. It can't be easy to feel like you went through four years as a machine who is just fulfilling requirements of the requirements. However, if you want to feel challenged and go beyond what is expected, you can seek out opportunities around you to experience new things and maybe break that feeling of being a robot. But like a lot of things, if you want to have a meaningful experience in anything, it takes a lot of time and energy for it to happen. So for our listeners out there, I'd really love to hear some input from all of you. Do you or did you feel like a robot as you go through your university experience? Do you feel like you have been thinking critically throughout your time here? If yes, why? If not, why not? We'll keep the conversation going with an upcoming blog post on our website that is learningcommons.ubc.ca or you can find the link to the post in our description below. If you have any thoughts, concerns, or ideas that you would like to share with us, you can tweet at us at UBC Learn. And we also have an Instagram handle that is UBC Learn where you can reach us there too. And with that, I'd like to thank you for tuning in to this episode of Intuition. We'll hopefully see you again in the next episode, hopefully joined by Flynn, who will be back from his luxurious vacation. Thank you so much. See you. <laughs>